and I uploaded it in a file. I'm not sure if you're able to get it. And if you, if you aren't, the file's too big because it did a video for the reflection. Okay. Um, so I, I shared the Google link and I put your email in the, um, I guess the shareable portion or whatever. So if you can't find it, just let me know and I'll try to, I'll try to send it to you again. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, you know, uh, when we do videos and stuff, especially I know it can be difficult because you can't always get them in um, into Moodle in their, the, their big file. So yeah, just send me a Google link and if I have any problems, I'll, I'll get back with you. Um, I didn't get everything graded um, this week. I had to make an emergency trip to Dallas yesterday that I didn't expect. Um, so usually I grade on Tuesdays and uh, like I said, I, I was driving, so it probably wouldn't have been safe or smart um, for me to try to do any grading while I was um, doing this crazy, you know, drive to Dallas, spend three hours there and turn around and drive back. So it was a pretty long day. Um, all right, so let's do this first. Let's go ahead and look at um, what's going on here in EDL 700. Let me get back out of my screen. Okay, so we are in week five. Let me pull this up. There we go. And let me see if I can do a share screen. There we go. Okay. Um, so give me a thumbs up, guys, if you're seeing uh, the Moodle course, Moodle bot week five. Okay, awesome. All right. So you have two. Um, they, you have two major things that are happening this week. Uh, number one, you have a discussion forum. Uh, I think you're pretty used to those by now. Um, so, you know, you'll just click on and do your discussion forum for the week. Uh, and here are the five questions. Just a reminder, um, and like I said, I think it's really not an issue for anybody, but just, you know, just a reminder. Uh, you have five questions to answer. Uh, and then I want you to respond to at least three of your classmates. And you can see we've already got a bunch of people who have done that. Uh, and then make sure too that you do use in-text citations to support your responses to the five questions, um, as well as uh, make sure you complete a reference page, okay? or not a reference page, but you include your references at the bottom. Uh, that's how you earn the full points for this one, okay? So let me back out of this again. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also to, um, I'm just gonna go back for a second to last week where we talked about the mid, uh, midterm. This is not due until February 21st. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, it depends on your, I guess, perspective. Uh, this is an independent um, assignment and just make sure that um, you are creating a one pager. You can use a graphic organizer, or I cannot speak, let me start over. You can either do a graphic organizer um, or an informational page you can post a picture or you can do a very short video. I mean, I think you would really be stretching it if you could come up with two minutes on these five questions. Um, so like I said, if it's one minute, that's fine. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to answer these five questions. I've learned the following about PLC, my questions I need answered. You will not need to do in-text citations or a reference page because <clears throat> with this particular assignment um, because it's really just your personal reflections on what we've done so far in the course and then um, kind of where we're headed with it, okay? Do not give me more than one page. I'm not looking for an essay or a dissertation or anything like that. It is simply one page at the most uh, with a graphic organizer, um, an informational page, a picture, or a very, very short video, okay? Does anybody have any questions about that particular assignment? Okay, awesome. Well, let's go ahead and look at case study. Oh, and by the way, too, I'm sorry, your midterm is not actually due until the 21st. Um, so you've got plenty of time to do it. Um, you know, if I were you, it's a pretty quick, easy assignment. I would probably knock that one out and get it out of the way. So this week I'm opening up for you. Um, there are three parts to the final exam. Uh, this is the first part. So they are cumulative in the sense uh, that the three parts um, build upon each other, okay? So it's not like you could go to week six and do part two or week seven and do part three and then come back and do part one. Um, it doesn't work that way. So let's look at this here for just a second. All right, so 
we have learned a lot about professional learning communities and we've talked about what makes them good, what are some of those barriers we face, et cetera. So you're going to put together a PLC plan, okay? And I have given you a template for this. Now, somebody asked me, do they have to use the template or can they write it as a paper? I, ideally, I really want you to use and do the template. Um, if you choose not to, um, I mean, I guess theoretically, you could just copy and paste the questions into a Word document. But again, I'm not looking for a, a 10 page research paper. This is really all about how do you take what we have learned and discussed so far and apply it in a real world setting, okay? So I'm gonna stop sharing the Moodle page for just a second and let me um, pull up the actual plan, okay? Now, I know sometimes templates don't work as well as we want them to when we go to load them in Moodle. So like I said, I guess technically you could just pull out the component pieces and put them into a Word document and then, you know, um, upload it as a Word document or as a PDF. But I, I'm not looking for paragraphs, guys. That's not what this is about. Um, so uh, it's pretty self-explanatory, I think, here on the first page that, you know, um, all you're going to do is you've got the title, you're going to put your name, um, either your school name that you work out or if you're going to, you know, choose a different school, that's fine, you know, and then the day. Then what you're doing in this particular template is that you're actually going to tell me about a professional learning community that you want to make the focus of this plan. So it can be a professional learning community that maybe you're already in at your school. Um, it may be one that you wish you had at your school. It may be one that you were a part of in the past. That's all fine. Um, if you don't have much experience with professional learning communities, just be creative and think, you know, um, this is what the kind of PLC that I think would be helpful to me and that I would want to participate in uh, within a school setting. Okay. I was touching the keyboard and somehow you managed to Facebook. Uh, so anyway, um, so you're going to tell me in the first part, what is the name of your professional learning community? It could be something like um, the algebra teachers at uh, XYZ High School. It could be the kindergarten team, um, you know, ABC Elementary. It could be the um, counselors. It could be, like I say, it could be really pretty much anything. It could be the administrative team. Uh, it could be maybe a multi-school professional learning community. So it's grade four teachers, grade five teachers, and grade six teachers from um, such and such school district or parish. Okay. Then you're going to tell me who the leader is. I'm not necessarily interested in a name. I really want the position, okay? So if this is gonna be, let's say that kindergarten um, professional learning community, that's our team. My leader might be the kindergarten team leader. Or um, if it's an algebra one, it might be the math department chair or the algebra lead teacher or the instructional coach, it might be the principal, et cetera. The same thing's true when it comes to listing members, I'm not necessarily looking for names because those aren't going to mean anything to me. It's more a matter of, let's say on that kindergarten team, we have five teachers. Uh, one of them is the lead. So that would be my, our leader, the kindergarten team leader. Then you can just put four classroom teachers. Um, some PLCs I know too will also incorporate special teachers. So it may also include your special education teacher. You may have the assistant principal who sits on it or whatever. Just kind of give me a sense of who is and who's on the team. The same thing's true when you get to subject matter expert. Again, I'm just tell me, you know, okay, if we're going to be working on um, reading, um, that's going to be the focus of our professional learning community. Well, maybe my subject matter expert would be the reading coach at my school, or it might be, um, you know, teacher C because she's, you know, she's got her certification in reading. She's considered a master reading teacher whatever okay and again like i said if you're part of a plc you can use that information or you can create one out of the air if you choose to then you're going to write your objective here so what is it that this plc is hoping to accomplish um so it might be something like um through the efforts of the kindergarten professional learning community um, the team members will effectively unpack learning standards and create highly effective um, lesson plans uh, to improve students' achievement in reading, okay? 
Then you're going to talk about the current state. So what do we mean by that? What are your demographics? So describe your team members. Um, and, and like I said, in this sort of instance, it might be that um, the kindergarten team leader um, has taught kindergarten for 34 years um, at X and Y Z school. Uh, and teacher A is a brand new first year teacher. Teacher B has eight years, is a mid career, has you know eight to ten years of experience or whatever. Then you're also going to look at the current data. So if you're in a PLC, tell us what are the strengths of that group, what are the weaknesses, and then where are areas that they could really grow and get better. If you're making up your PLC, you can do the same thing here. You're going to just make up what you think might be some strengths going into it, what might be some weaknesses, and then where are the opportunities that they can grow. So the next part of it is you're going to set some goals and outcomes, and you're going to be using the SMART goal format, which we're going to talk a little bit more about tonight. I'm only asking you to give me three um, goals and, or outcomes, um, and you can just do these in bullet points. Okay, then what is your call to action? So, you know, let me know. Um, tell me if this is you're forming a PLC group, you're reforming, you're re um, affirming, you're, um, you know, trying to um, make it stronger. You know, just give me a sense of it. And then give me some basically three ideas of what you're going to do in your PLC to get it moving. So an example here is I might ask all the team leaders, members, excuse me, to take the leadership profile assessments. Um, and I may also do a bunch of team building. Um, a third thing might be that I would ask the teachers to gather all their student achievement data um, and, and bring it to the next meeting. So only three things. So like I said, you just kind of always remember three. So we're wanting at least um, three bullet points in all of these except your objective, which is a single point, obviously, okay? Then what benchmarks are you going to use to measure success? Um, so again, you know, it goes back to that idea of formative and some of Ms. Johnson. Things. Yes, ma'am. Hey, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I just want to clarify something right there for the goals and outcomes, just because I know that every school kind of does that a little bit differently sometimes. Sure. Um, so you want their that can be like a specific one that may be for my next meeting with them and not necessarily like as a whole what our end goal is so like for instance um like i'm currently reforming upper grade assessment planning team mm -hmm. and um so like you were saying like one of the goals or outcomes i could tell them like you said gather achievement data but would that be under the would that go under the goal, the goal and expected outcomes or where would that go? Okay, so right here when it's talking about the call to action, that, uh -huh. that's, those are the things that you're gonna do. Okay, so okay. kind of think, so your objective is broad, right? Your objective is gonna be, this is the plan for the next six weeks for the kindergarten team. This is the plan for the year for the administrative team. This is the plan for the next two weeks. So your objective is gonna be broad. Then you're going to tell me a little bit about where the team is currently. That's what goes under current state. Then your goals and expected outcomes, they can be short-term or long-term goals, whichever makes more sense to you. Um, so, um, you know, that might be something like, like I said, that, you know, we're going to, like, we're going to uh, re, uh, we're going to visit our, um, student achievement results, and we're going to do a deep dig data analysis exercise. That might be right. one of your, your goals or outcomes. Right. So call, okay. Yeah. And then when you get to the call of action, you're basically taking that goal and putting them into a do step. You know, it's like the goal is this is where we hope to get to. The call to action is what are we going to do to get there? Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, so like I said, just it, it should flow pretty easily once you kind of get into it. It's like, okay, this is what we're trying to do. This is our goal. Now, what do I, what are the steps? That's the call to action. What are the steps we have to go through to get there? Okay. And then the next one is benchmarks. Um, you know, so again, how are you going to know if you're successful or not? It could be that you're going to look at formative assessment results. You're going to look at summative assessment results. You're going to track exit tickets. Um, there's a million different things that you can do. Um, you don't have to give me um, more than one uh, benchmark here. 
Um, but you know, ideally at least two or three would be would be nice. Okay. Um, and then we're going to talk about the pull through offer. So um, I don't know how familiar you guys are with pull through offers. It's actually a term from business and it's used pretty frequently in marketing. But the whole idea behind a pull through offer is what am I going to do? So I'm going to give you the business perspective first. So um, what am I going to do to get customers into my door? Or what am I going to do to get customers to buy my product? Um, so what is it that makes it attractive, okay? So if you kind of take that idea from a marketing perspective and you move it into an educational setting, how do you get people to really be involved in and buy into the work that needs to happen in the professional learning community? 99% of the time, people are told they have to do a professional learning community, so they do it in a cursory manner, just to check off the box, and they don't really leverage the true power of a professional learning community. So the pull-through offer is, what, and what is the sales tactic that I'm going to use to convince people to be a part of this PLC and to really be engaged in the work, okay? Um, if you're in a PLC, you kind of know what makes people tick. Um, so that would be your pull-through offer. Uh, if you're creating one, then you really kind of wide open. Um, but, you know, I know when we really went whole hog when I was a principal into the, the PLCs, um, I had some teachers who thought they were a waste of time. I had some teachers who uh, were at best passive aggressive and didn't really participate. So we, we had to, to sit them down individually and we really went through that deep dig analysis of their data and show them where their students really were. And even though if they had like the really, they had the gifted class or whatever, of course their results look good, but then we started tracking actual growth of achievement over time. And um, what we found was that the students who were um, passing the exams with no problem, but if you really track their actual scores, um, their growth rates were in the negative numbers. So that's how we approached it as a pull through offer. You may have a way better idea, but that just gives you a good example, okay? Then when you're talking about the process, this is just what are those um, professional development or job embedded pieces that you need to do to keep your professional learning communities working? So for example, um, when we did the big deal, deep data dive analysis, a lot of my teachers didn't really know how to interpret their data. They didn't know how to analyze it. So one of the big things we did as part of, uh, of that development piece is we did a book study on the book Data Wise from Harvard. And um, it walks you step by step about what do you do to look at your data? Well, how do you analyze it? How do you pull out the information you need to make informed curriculum and instruction decisions? Um, so that might be the development. Um, I've also, I had a team that um, did not get along at all. Um, every time that I put them in a PLC room, even if I was sitting there, they'd fuss and fight with each other and they accomplished nothing. And it finally got so bad, um, I couldn't figure out what I could do. I finally had them, I, I walked in and I pulled the board policy on all the reasons you could be terminated as a teacher and I passed out highlighters. And I had them go through and highlight um, the reasons and I had a very frank discussion with the team about you guys have done every one of these. By all rights, I could terminate every single one of you for cause. And um, you know that's not what I want to do. That's not the goal or the aim, but I, I can't seem to get you guys to understand that you have to work together. So you know sometimes it can be pretty dramatic or drastic what you're doing. Sometimes it's just that they need a good instructional coach or they need to have um, a peer teacher who gives them tips. Um, but anything that you want to list here as far as what you think your team is going to need to help them be more successful. So what are those development pieces? Okay. So the prospecting mechanism actually talks about the love language. So how are you going to make sure you're showing people praise um, or appreciation? How are you going to praise them? So let's say I'll go back to my kindergarten team example. I have five members. Uh, the team leader, I know that her love language is she really likes words of affirmation. So I'm going to list the kinds of things that I'm going to do um, for everybody on that team who has, is, who has words of affirmation as their love language. Um, if they have physical touch, and you can make this pretty generic, so it can be, you know, um, 
on uh, in the kindergarten professional learning community, there are five members, three of them. Um, their love language is um, words of affirmation. One of them is um, gifts and one of them is physical touch. For the words of affirmation team members, I'm going to um, you know, praise them and give them a certificate in the weekly faculty meeting. Uh, for the physical touch uh, team member, um, after each team meeting that was successful and there were great contributions, I'm just gonna give that person a high five. Uh, that kind of thing. Okay, so you don't have to get real specific, but at least give me some idea. And the next part is coaching questions. So just think about, because um, oftentimes when we're in meetings with people, we tend to ask yes and no questions only. Um, so here I'm asking you to give me just one, um, no more than three, of an open-ended kind of question that you might ask. Um, so an example might be, going back to my kindergarten team, and we're looking and we're noticing that um, our students are really struggling with um, summarization uh, when it comes to reading and, and our various assessment pieces. That's an area all of our students struggle. So my coaching question might be um, to the team, you know, we all know that our students are struggling with summarization. Um, what do you think are the contributing factors um, uh, to this challenge that our students are facing? Or it might be, um, you know, we did a really good job. Our students are really great at, you know, grasping and understanding the main idea, um, but uh, they're not doing as well with summarization. Um, so how can we leverage the skills uh, that they've mastered with main idea to bolster and support summarization? That kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. The post-event follow-up, how are you going to communicate what's going on in the team meeting? Um, are you going to publish the minutes? Um, are you going to have a, a, an email that goes to everybody with a quick summary? Uh, that kind of stuff. So it's just a, one idea on how you're going to communicate your meeting results and et cetera. Okay. Here to this one, professional development and other resources, that just expands upon the where I told you the list of development right above here in process. Um, so you can just copy and paste that right here, and then um, you'll be fine. Then when we talk about pre-planning, so what are the things, well, let me back up. Oftentimes when people do PLCs, they don't plan for them. They just, you know, it's kind of like everybody just shows up and we just sort of figure out what we're doing. So one of the things that you really should focus on, particularly if you're in a leadership role and you're molding and, and supporting other teachers, is what are you going to do before the meeting to make sure that it goes well? So something pretty obvious is I'm, you know, you're going to create an agenda and you're going to publish it. Um, so, for example, um, I'm working on um, some grants right now with the U.S. Department of Education, and we had a Zoom meeting the other day. And our team leader, you know, he'd already developed and sent out the agenda. He already had like uh, five key questions we needed to make sure we could all come to consensus about all of those kind of things. So, his pre-planning was that he he you know, pulled all of this to find a, a date and meeting time that worked. He sent out the Zoom link and the Zoom information, and then he shared the agenda to get our feedback and all of that. Then we had the meeting. So that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. You don't have to make it, it's not like rocket science or, you know, something really elaborate. It's just, what are those simple little steps I've got to do before we actually have a meeting? Um, and again, you only have to give me two or three items here. I'm not looking for, you know, like the entire year's plan. Um, and then if you have anything that's going to require money, um, you know, just uh, include that here. So, for example, um, we had a PLC room. Uh, we called it the war room when I was a principal. And that's where we held all of our PLC meetings. And so one of the things that when we were first starting out, we had to make sure that we had sufficient office supplies. Um, so we stocked the room with, you know, highlighters and pencils and I don't even remember what else. So, you know, it could just be something that simple. Um, you know, it may be that you guys want to post in, um, you know, uh, some place you want to post all these student achievement results and you need some poster board to do that. Um, so my example here is that, you know, we needed $32 for our data wall supplies and that was paid for by the principal. Okay. Then when you get here, what are the norms that you think are important? Um, and again, no more than three. So it might be um, be on time. Uh, the second norm might be that um, you know what we say what we say 
in the PLC, stays in the PLC, what we learn, we share. Um, you guys are probably very familiar with norms. I think we've all done tons of work with that. Um, but just list those three norms that you think are really important. Then you're gonna give me just a very short schedule. So for example, and no more than three meetings. So um, if this were, I'm going back to my kindergarten team again. So the first thing we're gonna do in our first PLC might be that we're gonna do, um, take all of the leadership assessments that we've done in class and get to know each other and to understand each other's communication styles, work styles, how they wanna be praised, et cetera. Then maybe at the second meeting, we're going to talk about what kind of data do we all need to go and pull for our particular students. Then maybe in the third meeting, we're going to do a deep dive analysis. Then in the fourth meeting, out of all that, we're going to create a student profile. But you only have to give me three topics. What are the resources that support it? And then you can make up a date. Um, so, um, you know, basically, if you're going to do it over one date, that's fine. You just list one. If you're going to do it over two dates, you can do that too. Okay. And then um, summative evaluation. And then um, just how are you going to know if this plan is actually effective? That's all it is. Um, and so it might be that um, we're going to do a member survey. Um, about the PLC and we're going to use the 321 method and all that is is you know um, what are three things I learned uh, what are two things that um, I still have questions about and then what's one thing I'm going to take and act and use from this professional learning community it might be um, something kind of like what you're doing for the midterm uh, you know what are the things that I've learned what are the things that I think are most important it can be anything guys there's no right or wrong answer necessarily okay so, questions. Okay, I'm gonna look real quick at the chat, guys, sorry. Um, yes, you can use outside references for any assignment. You're, you're not bound solely to the references I give you. There's tons of information out there and you're welcome to use anything you think's appropriate. Okay. Seriously, no questions, guys, I'm shocked. <laughs> Okay, then. So it's not a, the case study, the final exam, um, all three parts are not actually due until our last, um, our last class, which is on Saturday, February the 27th. Um, so you do have quite a bit of time to do this. But again, um, I would just caution you, because uh, I've seen it happen a million times. Students wait till the day it's due. Um, to do all three parts, and it, it ends up being a little more overwhelming than they think it was going to be. Um, and then, you know, there's a technology glitch, or the internet goes down, or who knows, you know, Moodle blows up, whatever. Um, and then they can't get their assignment in. Um, so, you know, like I said, just kind of, just kind of make sure that you're pacing yourself accordingly. The last thing that I'm going to do before we talk for just a second, and let me see where I can find it here. I'm going to walk you through very quickly SMART goals. Um, most people are pretty familiar with SMART goals um, because they're something that has been, they've been around for a very long time and tons of, school use, tons of schools use these. You may even have been using SMART goals and not known it. Um, so for example, by, my bachelor's degree is actually in special education and secondary English. And I have been writing SMART goals since, you know, 1980 something. Um, and they just weren't called SMART goals back then. Uh, you know, if you're writing a learning objective on, on the board every day in your classroom, you're, you're writing a SMART goal, whether you realize it or not. Um, so let me share this with you real quick. And um, like I said, I'm just gonna walk you through some SMART goal stuff. Let me make sure I'm on the right page here. Okay, so this is actually not until next week. This is week six that you're gonna have a, um, this part of the assignment, but let me just show you real quickly. Obviously no submissions. Let's look at the template. Okay, sorry, I gotta move it over. I have to stop sharing again for a second, bear with me. Here, smart goal, share, there we go. Okay, so again, um, you can pull the work you've already done um, in week five and you can tell it, you can just copy and paste right here. Here's the team, here's the team members. 
Um, what are those things that you as a team need to work on? And again, you can copy and paste it right out of that assignment that we just went over. Um, the same thing here, what is it your group would like to do? These can be your um, goals. Uh, again, just right there. And you're gonna basically write two SMART goals and that's it. You're gonna write one for students and you're gonna write one for the staff. So theoretically, if you wanted to go back to um, the assignment that we did this week, the crosswalk where you unpack the standard, that can be your student learning goal. So you can go back and pull your student standard and tell me what to make sure that it is specific, measurable, attainable, results oriented, and time bound. So for example, students will be able to successfully add um, two two-digit numbers without regrouping with 90% accuracy by the end of February 2021. Okay. So was my goal specific? Yeah, it was a very specific, discrete skill. Was it measurable? Yeah, I said 90% accuracy. Is it attainable? Yeah, I'm not asking them to, you know, um, do uh, exponents or whatever in, in second grade kind of thing. Is it results oriented? Yes, um, we know exactly what it is that we're expecting them to do. And is it time bound? Yes, because I said by the end of February, okay? So like I said, you guys probably don't realize you have done a million just like me, I can, I can just, shoot them out like, you know, like popcorn kind of thing, um, because we do these all the time. Special education teachers, anytime you write an R goal, you are writing a SMART goal. Then the same thing's gonna be true for the staff. So for example, my staff learning goal might be, um, teachers will be trained in the data-wise data analysis process so that they can unpack their, unpack, um, what am I trying to say? Unpack student um, standards with 100% accuracy by the end of September. Okay. I mean, like I said, it doesn't have to necessarily be tied to a standard if you don't want. If you want to use a standard to kind of get you going, that's fine too. But like I said, you can just make it up, um, you know, like I just did. Okay. So that's pretty simple. Then the next part of this is on this particular one, um, you're just gonna tell me again, you can pull it off of your um, template that we just talked about. What are the topics? You don't have to go into detail, just the main topic. So it might be in week one, we're gonna do team building activities or we're gonna do the leadership assessment profiles. And in week two, we're gonna do some team building activities to get to know and understand each other. Then in week three, we're going to talk about what is the data points that we need to be focusing on and we want everybody to bring to the table. Then in week four, we're going to do a deep dive data analysis. And in week five, we're going to create student profiles from that. Okay. So like I said, don't make this harder than it needs to be, guys. I, I get students 90% of the time when they struggle with these assignments is they overthink it and they make it way harder than it's meant to be. What I'm looking for here is not a specific right answer. What I'm looking for is, do you understand the concepts of a PLC and what makes it effective enough to apply it into creating a usable document um, that can guide what we're doing? Okay. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm looking at the chat. Hang on. Yes, and, and Candace basically, I'm not going to read this. You guys can, um, I don't, I need to see that to me directly. Yes, yeah, so I'm not going to go exactly um, what it said, but um, when will all three parts of the final be posted? Um, I just went over part one, then I just went over part two, which is the SMART goals, and then part three is pretty simple, so we won't worry about that yet, but they're all open and available to you now. I opened up the rest of the course, um, so you can do that. And then um, just kind of in a nutshell that if you have, if you feel like you're struggling with an assignment, those of you that have had me before know this, and I'm afraid I, I've forgotten to tell everybody else, um, you are more than welcome to email me a draft of your assignment, and I will give you feedback um, and let you know, hey, great, you're on the right track, you know, do a little bit of editing, submit, and you're fine, or if you're like way off base, I'll get you back on track. 
Um, so like I said, do not hesitate to send me an assignment and I'll give you some feedback. And even if you don't do that and you don't get the grades you want, um, again, email me and we'll figure out a way to come talk through it. Because in my mind, I know, you know, I'm not in the college of business where we're expected to grade on, you know, the bell curve and fail X percent and all that kind of stuff. This is about mastery of learning. Um, and, you know, my goal is for everybody to walk out of here with an A, but also to walk out of here with the, uh, the tools that you can actually use um, and put into place and then have the, the basic understanding and foundational knowledge you need. So if you're taking your principal certification test or, you know, something like that, you're going to do great on it because you really do understand um, these sort of big rock things that happen in school. Does that make sense? Okay. Awesome. All right, any questions? I do have a quick question about that case study one. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I, I know you went over it, but the subject matter expert, does that need to be a person who's involved, like a person that's a PLC member? Or can not that be an outside person? Yeah, no, not necessarily. It could be someone who's outside of the PLC. It can even be, um, like for example, we were really struggling with, um, and my teachers and I, um, when we first kind of started getting into the whole idea of that triad of curriculum instruction and assessment, and, and what does that really mean and look like? Um, and so um, our subject matter expert actually was Heidi Hayes Jacobs. I couldn't afford to bring Heidi Hayes Jacobs to my campus and be our personal coaches. Um, so what we would do is like we would watch her video, you know, we would all take different pieces. It's like we'd watch, you know, so-and-so's going to watch this video. I'm going to watch this one. So-and-so's going to read this book. Um, I got to go to one of her training sessions. Um, and so our subject expert was not a physical, not, oh, she's a person, but you know what I'm saying? She wasn't physically there with us ever, um, but we used her tools and her resources. And so she was our subject matter person, that kind of stuff, if that makes sense. Um, it could be somebody at the curriculum level uh, from the district office. It could be um, somebody at a different school. It can be a, a member of the PLC. It's really, it really just whatever makes the most sense to, to kind of help and guide you guys. Okay. Any other questions, guys? Okay, well, I'm going to pull up the, oh, don't do that. Sorry, sometimes it doesn't like the things I try to do with Zoom. Let me close that real quick. And let me pull up for y'all the presentation tonight. And again, like always, I, I, I talk way too much, so I never get to get through these like I want to with y'all. But hopefully, these are pretty self-explanatory, and so it's not like I need to hold your hand and read it to you. So let me share my screen again. Here we go. OK, all right. So I will tell you, I did not plagiarize this. Um, I actually have permission from the author, um, but this is not my work. Um, I actually, I was very fortunate at one time in my career um, that I was named a scholastic, um, what was the, the term? Scholastic Leadership Fellow. Um, and so I got to go like all over the country to these amazing professional development things. Um, and I happened to be in New York and got to go to this one that was done with in partnership between Scholastic and the International Center for Leadership and Education. So this was their presentation. I mean, it was a trainer trainer's model. That's how I can legally use this. So one of the things they really talked about in here is what is a PLC leader? People tend to think that it's a particular position, which is not necessarily true. Okay, so what is a professional learning community? We all know this. It's a group of people who are working basically together to solve a problem and to create um, some sort of solution to whatever it is that the problem is. Okay, that was a really bad English sentence. Sorry about that. Um, they also reminded us about the differences between discussion and discourse. Discussion is when it is a two way conversation. Discourse is what I'm doing to you guys. I'm basically lecturing you, okay? So we also know too that if you think about, and, and I would really encourage you guys, if you're leading a, a particularly a new PLC or maybe you're like kicking off the year um, with your PLC or whatever, this is a really nice graphic that kind of tells what it is a PLC is all about. 
Um, and this was taken um, from, you know, the gurus, D4 and um, Acre. Okay. We also know too, there are some best practices that we should be following. And again, I'm not going to read these to you, but, you know, certainly starts with vision. Um, and it is both action and result oriented. Okay. A lot of times people use PLCs to do a whole bunch of what I call administrivia. Um, so a PLC should not be about planning the Valentine's party or the next field trip or, you know, anything like that. Um, in fact, when I was a principal, we had a, a structure where we had two kinds of professional learning communities. We had one that was solely instructional. And I, I mean, literally, you were not allowed to talk about anything else um, other than curriculum and instruction, teaching and learning and assessment. Um, but we also knew, too, that we did have to deal with the, um, you know, other side of management, um, you know, particularly in a high school when you've got 10,000 activities going on at any given time. So we had a, a completely separate group um, and they were called, they, they dealt with all of those pieces, okay? But we made our professional learning community, um, we called our campus instructional leadership teams, that was sacred time. So we know what the benefits are. We also know this is the cycle of what you have to do when you're planning and creating one. We also know um, the four magic questions that you should be asking in a PLC. So what should students know and be able to do? How, long, how will we know that the students have, done, have mastered or learned it? How do we respond when students do not learn? And then the one that a lot of people forget, which I think is just as important, how do we respond when our students learn more? So for those students who have already mastered the content, what do we do to enrich them? So it's that idea of we're pulling everybody to center. Then once we get everybody to center and understanding you know, uh, of this concept, we're going to have some that need remediation, but we're also going to have some that probably already knew everything we had just taught before we taught it. So how do we keep pushing them forward? So that's our gifted and talented, oftentimes, students, okay? So the other part of that's very important in a professional learning community is to build relationships so we can improve our student performance. So we know that these are the elements that have to come together to create a successful PLC. And as a campus leader, um, typically the principal, you have to make sure that these five elements are in place so that you can have a successful PLC. So one of the big, my big pet peeves is that we expect teachers to do these, but we don't give them time to meet, discuss, to share, to do all of that. So as a leader, these are very, very important. And you have to not only create the conditions for these five elements, you also have to model these five elements, okay? All right, let me scroll on down here. So this is again what that looks like in the, in the linear thing. So one of the first things that I, I, I have always done and certainly the research backs me up when you're creating or you're working towards a PLC or you're trying to re-energize one, you have to understand what the barriers are that keep you from having that supportive culture and structure necessary to the success of a PLC. So I always went through this activity with our teachers um, and where we listed all the barriers um, as a group and then we prioritized which were the ones we could actually affect and change. Okay? The other thing we need to remember too is if we want there to be collaboration um, within a professional learning community. Sometimes you have to teach people what that looks like. Um, so we, we went through development on, you know, what it means to pause or to paraphrase or probe, um, those kind of things. So these, were the, these are norms that can help lead you to collaboration, okay? So the next several slides, and again, I'm not gonna read them to you guys, but you know, I hope you will take the time to go through them really goes into detail about each one of these seven norms of collaboration. So, um, you know, pausing. So, you know, if there's a question, uh, you wanna pause if there's, after someone speaks, if there's a personal reflection or even institute a collective pause. Um, so one of the best teachers I've ever seen when she was working with her students, 
um, you know, she posed a question and then she would say, okay, in the next two minutes, I want you to reflect on what the question's really asking you and um, what your answer is going to be, but most importantly, your justification for your answer. And if you disagree with somebody else, you know, how would you handle that? Um, so she actually built pause or reflective um, thinking time into her lesson. Okay, so paraphrasing, what does that look like? Probing. Uh, we all know, I think, what a probing question is and how important that is. But not only should we do that in our classrooms with our students, but it's also great to do this within a professional learning community. So um, instead of, you know, maybe our normal tactic, we might want to say, you know, um, somebody just brought up a new idea and you might want to say, can you tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, why you think that's a great strategy? Okay. Um, putting ideas on the table. Um, so again, some language that you can use to get the, the flow of thoughts happening. Obviously, we know about paying attention, or at least we hope we do. Um, and again, you'll notice here that this talks about learning styles, physical cues. This is why it's important that we spend time with um, assessments and team building. So we really understand where people are coming from. We also want to presume positive intentions. Um, and, and, you know, that's the whole idea that, and I think personally, these are great norms in and of themselves, uh, that we want everybody to succeed. We want to hear all ideas. We all can work well together. Okay. Then pursuing a balance. So what does that look like? Okay. And that's like, if you want to use this, um, that's just a quick little like table activity you can do. Okay. Um, Bill Daggett, who's one of my favorite um, educational researchers, researchers um, talks about um, in his work all the time about how professional learning communities are really there to help teachers to grow and to really become not only highly effective, but to use the best practices and to understand and support peer collaboration. Okay, so if I were, you know, rolling this out um, as a new principal, these are some of the things that I'd want to make sure that I pay particular attention to. It's not a checklist per se, but it's certainly a very critical piece um, that leaders need to understand and figure out before you go in to full-blown implementation. Okay. So, what questions or comments do you guys still have tonight? I'm looking to see if I've got any messages. Okay. okay looks like I have, have a question. Before. Yes, ma'am. Um, so we're just starting at our school, you know, real PLCs. Mm -hmm. And with the, you know, we're a UIR school this year. Um, and so we, this afternoon I had my, uh, our UIR after school meeting with all the contents and stuff. So tomorrow I have to lead you know, my content teaming. Okay. And it's really just hard. Nobody wants to do it. Yeah. You know, um, and it's really hard because changing the mindset. Yes, and it's hard to be on the forefront of that and to be their peer. I mean, is that normal to have that? Because I am the peer, but I am talking to them as if I have authority when yet I don't. <gasps> You know, yeah. uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't know, Stacey, if I would say that's the norm. Um, I've seen it happen pretty frequently where they're expecting peers to step in and affect change with other peers. And that can be a very big challenge. I guess my advice to you would be try to make it fun. Try to show them why this is going to help them and benefit them. You know, um, when people tend to be more bought into things when they can see a direct correlation to their work, you know, yeah. so if it's going to save them time, if this is going to um, strengthen their, um, their planning, if it's going to have this, you know, you know, if you can quantify it even, that's even better. Um, and I think I would, I would approach it more from as opposed to here's my presentation and here's what you guys need to do as a matter of I would use some really good questions and get as much feedback from them as you can um, and then let them help you prioritize what are the most important elements um you well, know that's a pro well I, I I 
sent an email last or earlier in the week, you know, what are some things that uh -huh. to give them ownership? Yeah. I got zero. Mm -hmm. People zero don't do that. that. Um, we're, I, I think I've told you guys, we're, we're launching this huge project with LSU. Um, it's going to take us a full year to get it ready and up and running. And they sent out a survey and nobody responded. And they sent another survey out and nobody responded. Today, we got the nasty email from the vice chancellor. You must do this. Um, yeah. Because people just, you know, it's time. It's, it's, you know, for us, there's still a little bit of distrust with the people running the program. You know, like, uh, we're not really sure what you're going to do with my day. My answers is, it, I'm not, you know, anonymous, all that kind of stuff. Um, I always had people do that work in the meeting. So I don't know if you're familiar with um, two strategies. I'm gonna. I can't. I'm afraid I can't remember what the name of one of them is. But uh, one's plus delta. Um, so what I've always done is, you know, if, if I'm teaching you about, I don't know, I'll pick math um, standards or math content. What are all the things that are working? Let's list all the pluses. Then the deltas are. What are all the things that are not working? You know, and then um, from there, I would do a nominal group technique. Um, and the way that you do that is, here's our numbered list of all of our problems, okay? Um, you know, let's say there's 10. So the one that you think is like in your face, the most critical problem we absolutely have to correct, that gets a 10. The one that's like, eh, it's minor. We can, you know, we're okay if we don't uh, do that, you know, they get, it gets a one. And so everybody gets a sticky note, they go put their number up on the, you know, a big sheet of white paper on the whiteboard or whatever you do, then you total them up and the ones with the, like the one that has the most points is going to be the barrier that we actually choose to address. And then that way it's done collaboratively. It, it's not that, you know, well, Tracy decided or Susie decided it's, we all decided this. And I found when I've done that, that sort of resistance goes away. Because everybody's kind of like, yeah, yeah, you know, we're, we're doing this. And, and, and it's interesting, you'll see teachers start to talk to each other and be like, you know, gosh, I'm really kind of stuck. Is this more important or is that? And, and they'll convince each other. So the more, you know, make it fun, make it interactive, show them how this is going to benefit them. And when all else fails, bring food, chocolate, um, you know, just those little things. And I'm, I mean, you know, I also too, we would make it a game. We'd have competition. There's a, there's so many different ways. In fact, there's a book out there that's called, it's old, but it's called Games That Professional Developers or Development People, something like that. I think it's Professional Developers Play. And it's full of all kinds of interactive activities that you can do. Um, you know, they're great for students, but they're also great for teachers. Um, and for adult learners. So like I said, you know, just what people don't want is here's the problem, here's the plan, here's how we're gonna solve it. And thou shalt go out and. Um, teachers resist that. I think we all resist that naturally as adults. Um, so, you know, just kind of take a deep breath, make it interactive, make it fun. And I think it'll go much better than you were anticipating. <laughs> Well, I do it. I mean, it's every week. Yeah, I do the, you know, it, so it's just like, we're going, we're going. And I've kind of hit a, and we meet formally once a week, but we're yeah. together every day. So yeah. I get both sides. I get, here's me, I'm going to gripe about life. And then on Thursday, it's all professional. And on yeah. the other days when they're griping, they're making comments of, oh, well, this is just paperwork. Even the supervisors at the at the district level, it's just paperwork, you know? I'm like, but it's not paperwork. <laughs> so I well, hear both sides of it. And I'm, so yeah. it, that's what makes it even harder that I'm not breaking through. Yeah, um, and teachers and I mean, really any group, what, I mean, I, I've seen this happen because I've done consulting with business groups and stuff too. It happens with them also. Um, we do ask people to do sometimes a lot of unnecessary and redundant paperwork. Um, and so, I mean, I've, I've led people through an entire meeting where it's like, okay, here's all the things that the district says we have to do and submit. Here's all the things that the school says we have to do and submit. And here's the things that we've created that we think are necessary. 
And then we would literally go through and weed out the things we didn't have to do, um, or we group them so that we could streamline it, um, you know, and maybe it was like, okay, we're going to assign to Tracy these three pieces of paper for the group and, and things like that. And even though that take, I mean, it takes a time, but it, it made such a huge difference because people felt like we, I was at least paying attention to their concerns and we were trying, you know, um, to, to make more sense of this. And, um, you know, we, we would even get to the point where like, what are they, what, what's the, you know, my favorite coaching question has always been, what's the worst thing that can happen? So, you know, the district says that every Friday I have to turn in this stupid data report. Um, what's the worst thing that can happen if I don't do it? Well, you know, sometimes the worst thing that can happen is really no big deal. And so it's worth not doing, um, you know, so just leverage and really understand what we're doing. Um, the other thing that I know, like when my groups would sort of hit the wall, I, I would do something really, I worked mostly in my career with high school people. And I love high school people, don't get me wrong, but they tend to be the most jaded of all educators um, and um, the most challenging to work with in a lot of ways. So I would do something absolutely hokey and stupid. Um, you know, so I, I remember I, I spent like Saturday night on the weekend um, and I made uh, these stupid little, um, oh, what are they called? Styrofoam crowns um, for everybody on my team the males and the females. And I had a, and at our next PLC meeting, I had a coronation um, and I gave, you know, individual feedback to each person, you know, I, I'm crowning you king of blah, 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 because blah, blah, blah. And I really thought, you know, cause like I said, I'm dealing with these, you know, high school people who teach things like calculus too. They're brilliant. Um, and I really thought that they, they, they were so appreciative. They loved it. They talked about it. They even wore those stupid crowns around the school. Um, you know, um, so just kind of, like I said, don't, don't, it doesn't always have to be what we think it does. Does that make sense? You have to spend time valuing people and getting them to, to, to let loose. Yeah. yeah and go ahead. I think, Coy, did I see your hand go up? <laughs> Yeah, he's got a hand up. Yeah. I did. Um, are we kind of in the same boat with the URR label? And we also have an academic label as well. Uh, I was on that same meeting this afternoon. Um, but our thing is, being that it's academic, our PLC has to be in school embedded. So that's what's causing our issue, that we have to embed it sometime within school hours. We cannot do it outside of school hours. So that's where we struggle at. And uh, the focus is just kind of like all over the place because you're thinking about your kids, what you got to do to keep your kids for that hour, who's watching those kids, you know, and then going back and having to get dive back into instruction. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, I, I don't know how it is necessarily in Louisiana, but I certainly know in Texas, you know, when your school gets those, you know, dreaded labels, and they send in, you know, technical support assistance and all this garbage that just gets in your way. It really is challenging. Um, I guess my best advice to you guys would be to be creative and be flexible. Um, you know, so yeah, yeah, I understand you have to check the box kind of thing uh, to be compliant when you're in that situation. But I also think there are ways I guess I have a very rebellious heart, but we always found <laughs> ways to work around the barriers that others were creating for us. And I will yes. tell you, and, and you know, and I, I, I sold this idea even to my students. Um, you know, when our school is really struggling, um, I somehow convinced almost 3,000 high school kids that, yeah, our football team sucked. <laughs> you know, we had won a game and, you know, and all of this, but I was like, but by gosh, we're going to prove to everybody that we have the smartest kids in the entire city. And I'm like, and if we, you know, we're going to be able to look and say, so what that you can, you know, whatever, you know, your district champs and all this and these other things, we're the yeah. smartest. And like I said, it was just that constant messaging of we're not going to let everything else that's unimportant impede us from what we need to do. Um, and so we created competitiveness competitiveness around academics 
okay. and you know, and and when we did well, and and we went from a, a very poor school in terms of achievement to three years later, we were named the best school in America by the Intel Foundation. And it was it was it was not me. It was that somehow we just created this culture that you know what, we're going to prove it. We're, it's a, we're the underdogs. We're going to prove everybody else wrong um, and that we can compete with anybody because, you know, our kids are just as smart as theirs. Um, and, and interestingly enough, once we did that, then we, our football team went undefeated the next year and went to the playoffs for the first time in 50 years. And all these other successes started building on that. And at the end of the day, if you can, if you can reach that level of success you need to, nobody's going to bother you anymore. Correct. Um, you know, I mean, when I was yeah. running an exemplary school, and we were we were hitting it out of the park with our achievement results, nobody bothered us. And so, you know, I, I would say oftentimes to my teachers, we all hate this. We all, I hate it probably more than you do that will be, you know, they've got their thumbs on us, but we're gonna earn our way out of it. And then we're gonna laugh at them that, you know, it was our plan that worked, not what they told us to do. Bureaucrats cannot tell you how to run your school guys. And I will also tell you too, this is my favorite saying, compliance does not lead to excellence. Correct. And yeah, so Ms. Johnson, if I may, um, I wanted yeah. to tell them too, we're at a school, like we're not in corrective action, but I came, um, I got hired out of a school that was, that's always been an A or B school um, and came into a school that is on the verge of corrective action. Um, so, and we are uh, nearly 50% you know, ELL and it uh, was a dire situation last year when I came in, but facing some of the same things that you guys are talking about with the pushback from the teachers and having the school um, embedded PLCs and everything too that you are um, because we're supposed to find, I'm supposed to find time for them during the day. Now I'm the instructional coach, so it's a little bit different, um, but the, it's the same kind of attitudes. And so, you know, like one thing that, and, and I don't know if you're like this or not, Stacy, but uh, I'm a little bit of a, a a big loud kind of person, so when I first started having these meetings, I had to realize that the one thing that I needed to uh, dial back a little bit was the fact that I didn't know what kind of person had come before me. I didn't know if the person that had come before me had caused them to turn out the way that they were now. So um, not, not as far as the academic stuff, but as far as their attitudes towards the PLC, their attitudes towards professional development, all those things that it you know, took all those years to build up. And so when we first started having meetings, there was a lot of pushback. And you, know, you get the teachers that have been there a long time who don't want to listen to anybody who's younger than they are. You get new teachers who are just fresh out of college and they don't even know what a lesson plan is, you know, and then everybody in between. Uh, and so, and we, of course, that year we're also starting what we have in Louisiana is also Discovery Walks, which came from another state, but we have that at our school again this year as well, um, which is kind of corrective action, but not the same level. And so we have a team of people that come in and they meet with us and we have to develop action plans and smart goals and all these things like that. And, you know, there's a lot of teacher feedback on why do we have to do this and why do we have to do that. Um, and like Ms. Johnson said, this is, and that's something that I wanted to talk to her about, not with when I'm wasting everybody else's time, but later, Ms. Johnson, but um, where we, one thing I did was I told them like, look guys, yes, you have to do this, but you wanna make sure that they, if they don't believe that you believe it, then they're not going to ever buy into it. No matter what you do or how much you bribe them, you, you have to find a way to, to make yourself believe in what you're doing too. Even if you don't, essentially no, like you may not think, okay, I really need to do this, but there is a reason why the school is in corrective action. There is a reason why those people are there. You may not agree with everything they're making you do, but there's a reason why the Discovery Walk team comes to my school and it's because our scores suck, you know, and be what it is, that is what it is. And it, you know, you can't change all of that. And so what I did was I, I was like, look, how can we take what they're making us do 
and make it benefit us. Yes, we have to do this, or we have to, we have to fill out these papers. We have to do these walks where a team of like 12 people straight comes into your classroom and they are sitting here checking off boxes. How well are you doing blank, blank, and blank? Like 12 people at one time in my teacher's classroom. Some of them fresh out of college and they're like, oh my God, there's 12 people in my room. And then you're expecting the kids to act right. But um, half of whom don't even speak English, but whatever. Uh, and so I was like, how can we take this? How can you make it work for you? What can I do? that is gonna make this work for you and benefit you because that's what's really important. Because if I didn't believe it, they weren't gonna believe it. And that's what I did. And that's what I you know, have been trying to develop because it, it's not gonna change just because you don't like it. They're not gonna like it, Stacy, And they're not gonna say, oh, well, today I just, I'm gonna love it. They're not going to, you may not either. But if, if you know, if you wanna be successful and, and you wanna be able, because you're, it's a little bit different for you because you're there with them every day. You, and you have to make sure that you're not buying into the complaining too. You have to find a way to be like, yeah, I have to do this data or whatever, but it, it actually is not worthless because actually, you know, filling out that data page, analyzing that data, it actually does do something for you. It might be annoying, but it is the one thing that will show you the truth in your face and show you what there is or isn't, um, you know, what is or isn't happening or being accomplished and what you need to change. So that's what we did. And we were like, okay, we're going to start right here with this one thing and just start with one thing. And if they can find one thing that they can let benefit them in their classroom for them, and then you have one step up and you can go from there. And that, and that's just kind of how I did it because they were just like, they, they were just done when I got there. They, they had lost three instructional coaches in the last five years. They had gone through three assistant principals in the last five years, and they were just over it. They had, uh, you know, like eight to 12 new teachers every year since 2016. And I mean, it was just an insane amount of turnover. And, you know, we're trying to fix that. But with that comes a lot of new everything every year. And, and I just think, you know, like what Ms. Johnson was saying, is you, you just have to figure out how, to, how you're going to make it feel like it's benefiting them. And you got to ask them, what can, what can we do to where you can use this for you in a positive way? Yeah, the paperwork, it might be for them, but really you can make it benefit you. So how can you figure out a way to spin it for them? And you can, you can, you just have to figure out how it meets your students' needs. Yeah, Candace, you're, you're dead on right. Um, you know, in fact, you know, when I went to the school that, you know, we were, we were in bad shape. And it was the same thing. I think I was like the fifth principal in six years and, you know, all this stuff. And I, I remember telling them, I'm like, you guys have been, you know, like Baskin Robbins. It's like, you're trying the 31 flavors. You're trying a new one every day. And we're not doing work that's allowing anything to work in the sense of, you know, you, you got to give it some time. And so one of the things that my, it was just myself and an assistant principal with almost 1200 students in an elementary school. And so what she and I did was, you know, with all that paperwork and nonsense we needed to fill out, we would do as much of it as we could as a group. And then I talked, I, I found, you know, some parents and, and, you know, stuff like that, that I knew they weren't even from my school, but they were just really community minded people who, you know, were always wanting to help. And I'm like, can I give you this form? And will you take these, you know, chart paper notes and the pictures we took from the whiteboard and will you put it into this form so my teachers are not wasting their time or my assistant principal or me um, typing all this in. And just that little tiny thing made such a difference because they, they saw that I was listening and I, I felt and shared their pain. Um, you know, the other thing too that is a great leverage strategy that I, I fell onto by accident when I became, when I got my first high school principalship and I went to a huge 3,000, almost 3,000 student high school, I was this, I went there in 2000. The school had opened in 1968. I was the third principal. The first two were there forever and a day. I was female and I was the first high school principal in that district that hadn't, quote, grown up in the district. I came from the outside. And they were, they just were blown away 
female, I was the first female principal in the district, high school principal, um, you know, and, and, you know, what did I know kind of thing. And I, I somehow accidentally managed to get two, it was three actually, three teachers who were like the biggest naysayers and what, if they said it, everybody believed it. You know, it, it's like, if, if they were gonna do it, then everybody's like, yeah. Um, and I somehow, we somehow, my, my administrative team and I hooked them in and we gave them some leadership roles. They've never been asked to be a leader um, because they're ready to try to avoid them. And when, you know, we announced in 2001 that we were gonna deploy laptops and give all 3,000 almost students a laptop computer. And they were gonna take it home and then, you know, and they thought we had totally lost our minds. And so I'll never forget, we're in a faculty meeting and one of these teachers, cause they're all griping and complaining about, I don't know how to use it, what a waste of time. You can, you can just imagine the conversation. Now granted, this was 21 years ago laptops weren't as prevalent as they are now. One of those key teachers stood up and said, and she had been there since the school opened in 1968. And she stood up and she said, by golly, you know, she didn't say she actually cussed, but I won't. But she said, if I can do this and make it work, there is no excuse for the rest of you. And she's like, this is the direction we're going. And if you don't like it, it's time for you to go. And I mean, I almost fainted right there in front of the whole entire faculty. But because we had, we had leveraged her unofficial leadership into true leadership, she became that change maker and, and sold things I couldn't. So, you know, when you're doing this kind of stuff, like it's like Candace said, you know, and it goes back to what Stacy and, and Chloe are talking about. It's not only about the benefit that we can show the teachers, but it's also our actions that show it. You know, and, and particularly if your principal's not doing some things to take off the teacher's plates when you're in these positions, that's that is a huge part of the problem. You know, the standard rule is for every new thing that you add, you take away two things that you've been doing. And so, you know, if you're in a position where you can do that and you can look at the teachers and say, I know that you don't wanna do this. I know it's a pain in the butt. I know it's time consuming, but you no longer have to do this and this. You know, um, we always had teachers sitting in the hall on duty. I eliminated duty stations. I'm like, this is the biggest waste of time. I need people, you know, working with kids in their classrooms in a PLC, you know, whatever. And so, you know, just taking away duty stations was like, you thought I'd given them a million dollars. So you've got to leverage those things. And, and if you're not the principal or the campus leader, I know that's more difficult, but a lot of times it's just something the principal hadn't thought of. Um, but, you know, anything even small you can do will make a huge difference. Stacey, did we help you at all? <laughs> Oh, yes. No, it does help. And I know that, you know, being the change maker it is big. I just wish like Candace, I was the, you know, in the, in more of just the straight leadership role and not a classroom teacher in, you know, leading the, the teaming. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, I would have more time to make a more powerful impact if I had, you know, more time to plan. Well well, it depends. It depends on if you're in the classroom subbing every other day because everybody's out on Corona and you're also the technology That's coordinator who fixed uh, about 600 laptops today because DRC wouldn't upload. And uh, yeah, I have about 15,000 jobs. So it doesn't necessarily mean that I have more time. But that is also, true. you are also in a better position for them to trust you because I do also have to do observations and walkthroughs and sign papers and sit in on the meetings that are quite awkward when the principal's like, look, you need to sign this piece of paper because you know, you didn't do blank, blank, and blank. Awkward. So it's, yeah, yes it and is no. A give and take. So it's a, it's a give and take. It, it does give me a unique perspective to have authority to, to change things or like, you know, the principal's like, well, I feel like sometimes Candace, you're doing this to uh, get what you want. And I'm like, well, isn't that my job? Uh, aren't I supposed to say things in a way to get what I want I am good at it I'm not gonna lie you know like I might suck at basketball but I'm good at that you know but um but yeah but it is unique in that aspect but at the same time 
a lot of times they're like, well, you know, you also come in here and you write these papers and leave them on my desk that said, well, you suck at this basically, but you know, so it's very hard sometimes in that aspect. So, and I, you know, I, I might randomly end up teaching a uh, second grade for two hours a day because the second maternity leave sub quit in a row after only a week. And, and my teacher had twins and it's not coming back for 12 weeks, but you know, you never know. Yeah. <laughs> so, that yeah, is true. It is true. I almost, Grass isn't it always green. I almost didn't make it home for this zoom because I was updating 13 computers like 10 minutes before I got here that I had left over and was refusing to not finish them. And I'm going to pretend like I don't know how to do that the next time they say that. But anyway. Yeah, yeah Cindy, knowledge isn't always power. <laughs> yeah. And, and Cindy, one of the things too was we didn't let anybody off the hook. Everybody in the meeting had a role and responsibility at some point, you know? And it's so it's like, if you've got a group of 20 teachers, Stacy may lead it you know, this time, but she's going to volley it off to somebody else the next time. Or, you know, uh, we found a way to make everybody have some sort of responsibility and stake in the game. Um, and, you know, and it, they, they look at things differently when they're the one that has to stand up in front of the faculty or in front of their teammates and, um, you know, and, and present information. Um, and I think that's what makes it kind of hard too, is that I think, not that, it's the blind leading the blind, but I am learning with my principles, you know. Uh -huh. But use yeah. that. Use that. Yeah. Be like, guys, look, we're, we're all on this boat together. So it's sinking or not. It depends yeah. on all of us, you know. So, I mean, what, you know, what are you going to do? I'm not going to go down. So you guys are going to come with me. So let's figure this out. That's true. Yeah. That is true. But I just wanted to add. Um, yeah, go ahead, Emily. I, you know, I am that first year teacher, so I am, you know, learning constantly, but, you know, my principal, he took a sabbatical for the next two years, but my, um, my assistant principal, she stepped up and I mean, by no means she, not every teacher likes her, but she chose some of the more outspoken teachers, like y'all said, and said like, okay, you're my, you're my grade level teacher. You're my team leader. And, you know, you're the one that's going to go back and communicate with your, your other teammates, because I feel like whenever they come back and communicate with us, it's more on our level. And they tell us like, okay, guys, like, this is why we're doing this because we didn't do PLCs either at the beginning of the year. And, you know, I'm old school. We had double, um, double specials day where we had specific time one day a week to do it, but we get a PLC once a month here. And it's very, it's, you know, we get an hour, we go in there and sit down and they tell us the concerns and they tell us, okay, we're, we're changing this, we're fixing this, but they've kind of, they're working on it though. And they've been doing a lot better with it because, you know, at first it was just like, okay, we could get this in an email, but now we're actually taking down, you know, data and math because I'm the math and science teacher for fourth grade. And I'm going through and I'm like, okay, well, why are we pulling this data? And whenever they actually explain it to us, like, hey, this is why you need it. That made a difference because everybody's like, well, why do we need this data? It's halfway through the year. We haven't been tracking anything anyways. Like, why do we got to do it now? It's just paperwork. And I'm just like, okay, but why are we doing this? And so they came back and they explained. And that's the only, that's just another thing that helps because not every teacher is going to understand the purpose of it. So I just, you know, that's one thing that makes me as a first year teacher understand. And make sure you always ask those questions. But I mean, you got to have somebody who's willing to be, to go in there and, and get on the floor and, and do it with you, you know? And yeah. so I think, I think, you know, Ms. Johnson was that person too for her school. And, you know, that's the, that's the kind of leader I want to be too. And I, tr you know, like, and the teachers know that they can, they can, they recognize somebody who's genuine like that. Like you're saying, when that person comes back to you, you know, that they're giving you that honest answer. This is why they say we have to do this. And you can ask them, you know, okay, well, do you think this is going to benefit us or whatever? And so the teachers, they know when I come in their room, I'm going to get on the floor with them. I'm going to open the book with them. I'm going to do whatever needs to be done. I'm right there with them. I'm not standing up here, like telling them do all this stuff that I am not going to do myself. I'm not expecting you to do something that I'm not willing to do. 
Yeah, and see, we have all new math and science curriculum. We have three new curriculums this year in our school, so or in our district. And so I tell my principal, I'm like, because she comes in here, she pops in all the time, just checking and making sure stuff is all right. But, um, you know, I just expressed to her, like, I just, I hate text, I hate teaching lessons straight out the book. You know, it's constantly, okay, we're going in here. This is what we're doing. I want stations. I want to be able to do stuff because I graduated from LSUA this past May and we were all about groups and work and things like that. And, you know, I love the stations. I love being able to do like, okay, independent work and, you know, building stuff and stuff like that. But, you know, I don't know how to do that with this new curriculum. Like I would, and I always tell her, you know, is there a way that I can get out in the district and see other teachers teaching, you know? But that's also working with beyond stuff. your years. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say, you don't sound like most first year teachers. I'm pretty amazed. <laughs> Well, um, at LSUA, yeah. I don't know if y'all know, but at LSUA, we had to... come to Livingston Parish, come see me. Yeah, because <laughs> we, because um, I mean, we're student, you know, I student taught for an entire year and, well, six months technically, but, you know, I've had several, several, you know, hours in the classroom and teaching and all that, but I love what I do. And, you know, whenever you love what you do, you put it, all your time and effort into it. Yeah. You know, some of us are old and we, we were teaching before groups were a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say, y'all don't even want to know how far back I go. <laughs> well, you have no idea. We used, we used to write lesson plans in a little box. It was like this big, okay? It was like this big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember going to um, training to be in the first group of teachers in the Dallas School District who got um, an Apple IIe computer for my class. I thought you were going to say she got an overhead projector. Do they even know what that is? So, Probably wow. not, or a ditto machine, or any of that. Oh, my <laughs> The, the um, just one more thing to that just to remember um a lot of people don't realize that in the life of a school hang on, so i don't know why my dog yeah i think he's hungry i'm trying to get him to shut up my little hush um anyway um it goes in a cycle so it is very natural that around february is when everybody hits their lowest point you're tired you 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 know the end is coming but it's still too far away um it's that stretch of the year where there's not nearly enough holidays and breaks and so you know we all start off we're up here we're excited and then we go along we go along we go along and then it's like oh thanksgiving break and then we come back up because we can make it now to christmas or to the winter break but then when you come back from winter break it is downhill i mean and you're gonna you're about february or so you're going to hit rock bottom where it's like, I'm tired. I don't want to do this anymore. Everybody's grouchy and grumpy. Um, and then you'll hit spring break and then you can come back because you, you can actually see the end coming. So part of this is just that natural cycle or evolution within a school year. Um, and particularly remember too, guys, um, you know, we don't talk a lot about it in this class, but you know, if you're not familiar with this, the cycle of change and what that looks like, um, Stacey, it sounds like your group is right where they probably should be in terms of accepting the change. They're giving that pushback. They're doing all of that. It's almost like the stages of grief. They haven't reached acceptance yet. And the more that we, uh, we understand that, I, it just kind of relieves that personal stress we're feeling, you know, in the middle of all that. Is that that is really kind of a, I feel better knowing that the pushback is the close to the acceptance because some of that stuff I'm reading says this, the cycle could be like seven, six years. I feel like I read that somewhere. <laughs> Maybe I didn't read that years before they truly accept. And I was like, I can't wait six years. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know um, where I read that. I've read yeah. so much in the last month. I don't know, but it was like several years. You like know, three to five my mother years, was a retired principal. I'm sorry. I think it was like three to five years for complete smooth. Complete smooth. Yes. And I'm like, oh, I hope we're not on that upper end. I can't deal. With <laughs> well, I can't do it. But yeah. that's like effective PLC implementation across a whole school thing. That's not like them accepting what you're trying right. to, you know, dish oh, good, out. Good. I didn't read yeah. that right. 
and there's there's a cycle for PLCs, and I, I wish I remembered all the pieces, but it's basically you go through, there's first there's like major pushback um, and resistance, and nobody wants to play along with you. Then you go into like what they call storming, you know, which is where, you know, basically it's like you're, you're just living in a tornado where it's like, you know, gosh, nothing seems to be working. We just feel a lot of chaos and uncertainty and all that. Then you'll begin to move into um, what they call norming, which is where people will either begin to get on board or they'll self-select out. Um, so for example, when I was my first year, at the end of my first year, I had 34 of my teachers who resigned or left, retired, resigned, left or whatever. Um, and I took it very personally until my superintendent sat me down and I thought I was gonna get reprimanded, maybe even fired for losing so many teachers. Cause you know, part of our, our pro, you know, our evaluation was um, teacher retention. And he was like, congratulations. He said, that's exactly what needed to happen. Um, and so you'll get that and then there will come and, and usually for most teams, it's only about six months. Um, sometimes I've seen it go to a year, but where everybody's kind of like either resign themselves to this isn't going away or they've, they've actually bought in. Um, so like I said, it's normal right now to feel what you're feeling, okay. to be frustrated, to feel all this chaos. But I promise you there is hope at the end of the tunnel and they will come along. Um, but you know, we all, we all hate the state coming in and doing anything. Trust me. You know, but, Luckily we're not to the state level yet. We're fair. like, we're a year before, you know, and sadly the problem area is our special, our, our special ed population, you know, and sadly all of this professional development that we're giving in the content areas the special ed teachers don't get those times all right they're not remember but remember the special education students are all of our students so they are and i mean and i have the special i'm there in i'm their teacher this year that's not the other ela teacher and but as far as like the the talk around the kids i can get you the most bonus points don't forget that that's why i wanted them in my class every year I just wish that the special ed teachers were, were their schedule was designed to be in this professional development every week. Well, yeah, and if that's your, if that's your, that out for yourself. Yeah, I was gonna say, if that's your targeted population that, that's hurting your scores, I think I'd be just like on my principal's desk, you know, jumping up and down saying, hey, you know, this is really what we need. And there's a way. Um, you know, yeah. through creative scheduling and stuff that I would get those teachers in there. And I know, yeah. you know, when I was at a district leadership level in Irving, it was kind of the same thing. You know, we, we were, we were, we had the, the largest percentage of second language learners in the state of Texas. And, um, you know, and we had a ridiculously high number of um, special needs students. And so we made the, de the decision at the district level. So you might even have to go to that point, but we made the decision that, we did major content training for every teacher in the district. And I didn't, if you taught, I don't know, as a special education teacher in the middle school, you went to that same development that, you know, my middle school, that the middle school teachers were going to because we knew they needed the same skill set as everybody else, those teachers did. So just kind of start thinking strategically. I might even go and sit with the special education teachers and just say, hey, what do you guys need? How can I help you from a content perspective? Um, you know, because they're probably they're probably feeling the pressure too. One's okay, not guys, feeling we've had an amazing pressure. discussion, but it is now <laughs> seven to ten. Um, and I, 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 we still got people hanging in there with us, which I'm really yeah, impressed. Like, like like my like my daughter was just she's just like having a little bit of a nervous middle school breakdown. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> uh, my dog is not going to let you go any well, longer. <laughs> my, my dog was okay with it until your dog was barking. She was fine. The cat, the cat was like, I'm going to leave y'all alone today, but the dog yeah. was fine. Well, um, and guys, I, w I mean, seriously, too, you know, you guys are really amazing. Uh, you know, the students in this class really bring so much to the table. You know, so, you know, if we need to, we can always do just an informal opt in if you want to opt out if you don't want to just a, a discussion about, you know, here's what I'm facing. What do you guys want? 
um, because you guys really can be powerful mentors for each other. So I, if y'all want to stay on, I'm just going to leave the meeting because she's driving me insane right now. I got to go though. I, do, I am going to use the crowns though. I'm going to crown my people. Yeah, okay. I'm using that I've done idea. I've the crowns too. The crowns are amazing. Hobby Lobby, they it. have these little kids. They're like for Bible school, maybe. I don't know, something. But yeah, it's super cheap, yeah. super easy, and so hokey. Mm -hmm. And if a high school dated, like, you know, like I said, my calculus teacher who, you know, was brilliant and smarter than any of us put together. Um, when I saw him wearing that around the building, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I'm just blown away. So, all right, you guys have a great night, a great Thank weekend, you. and we'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye.